As we mark another World's AIDS Day, it is sobering to acknowledge that so far about 36 million people have died of AIDS-related illnesses. And although there is still no vaccine, still no cure, considerable progress has been made in the fight against AIDS. But it's been a long and painful journey. When the first AIDS cases surfaced in the United States in the early 1980s, it was considered a gay disease. No treatment to fight it. Diagnosis meant a virtual death sentence. Soon, drug users and those infected by blood transfusions were showing up among the sick, too. America was panicked. Hope to have a good life. Teenager Ryan White, who contracted HIV through hemophilia treatments, was even expelled from school and became a symbol for the AIDS crisis. Then, in 1985, AIDS claimed the life of movie star Rock Hudson, and the disease started to get global attention. The world was shocked again when American basketball superstar Magic Johnson said he was infected, too. Because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. By then, life-saving drugs were becoming available in America, but the disease was spreading worldwide. It had become an epidemic, and the death toll soared. So far, AIDS-related illnesses have killed about 36 million people, and an estimated 35 million are living with HIV. Today, the worst hit area is sub-Saharan Africa. There are 25 million HIV positive, and there were 1.2 million AIDS-related deaths in 2012. But there's some good news, too. Anti-HIV drugs are saving millions of lives. AIDS-related deaths have dropped 30 percent since peaking in 2005. And new HIV infections are down by 33 percent since 2001. Now there's talk of an AIDS-free generation. Some even saying the end of AIDS is in sight, although the search for a vaccine and a cure continues. Joining me now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. He is one of the world's leading experts on HIV AIDS. His work in this area has earned him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He's also the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Fauci, thanks okay. so much for talking to us. Uh, no one knows this journey as well as you do. I've heard you talk about, in I think it was June of 1981, you got this report of these five gentlemen with the mysterious disease in Southern California. And now here we are, millions of people affected all around the world. What has that journey been like? The ups and the downs, uh, there's had to have been some low points, some high points. Describe it for us. Well, it's been, as you alluded to, a very long, tortuous journey that had uh, peaks and valleys, had periods of considerable frustration, pain, suffering, uh, anxiety from 1981 through the mid-80s and into the early 90s were very, very difficult years. The first uh, real uh, uh, light that was shown on it was when the virus was discovered, because we went a couple of years from 1981 to 1983, 1984, you know, having people come in with an overwhelmingly devastating disease, almost 100 percent fatal, and we didn't even know what the cause was. When HIV was discovered, very soon thereafter, the blood test was devised, which not only screened the blood supply and protected the blood supply, but also gave us some idea of the enormity and the depth of the pandemic, because there were a lot more infected people than we thought, because they were not yet sick. The one thing I remember so clearly, because it was so dark for me, is that when I was taking care of patients in the early 1980s, the median survival of my patients was six to eight months. Mm -hmm which means that 50 percent of my patients would be dead in six to eight months, and the overwhelming majority would be dead in a couple of years. Now, today, that when you give the combination of drugs to someone in their, let's say, mid to late 20s, who is relatively early in infection, you could project that if they take their medications, these combination antiviral drugs, that they could live an additional 50 years. So that's really a transforming breakthrough. So now we have a lot of tools. We have treatment tools. We have prevention tools. We know how to prevent the transmission from mother to child. We know how to prevent transmission to individuals by a variety of medical and behavioral means. And the real challenge now is how you implement that globally. So as much as there have been breathtaking breakthroughs in science and public health, 
We still have a situation now where there are 35 million people living with HIV. We have 1.6 million deaths and 2.3 million new infections in 2012 alone. So we have a lot of challenges. We're really getting there. We're, we're turning the pandemic around in the sense of the deflection of the number of new cases is going down. And we actually can project that if we do things right, if we continue to implement the tools we have and develop new tools like vaccines, that it is conceivable that what was thought just to be an imagination years ago, namely actually putting an end to this pandemic, might actually have that aspiration be a reality someday. So there's terrible news that we're in the middle of pandemic, but good news is that we're making extraordinary progress. Yes, and I've heard you say that uh, you can see an AIDS-free generation. Uh, well, define that for us. I mean, what would it look like? Well, when there are a lot of definitions for that. We refer often to a tipping point, and the tipping point is when the number of people who are being put on therapy exceeds the number of new infections so that the curve of new infections or what we refer to as incidents keeps going down. That's one of the criteria. The other is that there are very few AIDS deaths because people who are infected are being put on therapy. And the other is that very few, if any, babies are born HIV infected. If you get those criteria implemented, then you could start talking about the feasibility of an AIDS-free generation where someone who's born in 2015 or 16, when they grow up, they could have a generation where AIDS does not occur. I mean, obviously, with the 35 million people who are already infected, we're going to have infected people around for a long time, we hope, because we want to keep them alive and we want to keep them healthy. But you want to decrease the number of new cases and give therapy to the number of people who are already infected. What's the situation like in, in countries with large populations like India and China? Well, you know, India and China, since there are over a billion people in each of those countries, even a very small percentage of incidence and prevalence is translated into huge numbers of infected individuals. When you go to Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you can have the prevalence of infection in the double digits in certain countries. Uh, that is measured in millions of people. You go to a country like China or India in which less than 1% or 1% of the population is infected, and you still have a huge number of people that are infected. So even though in those countries a fraction of a percent of people are, are infected, given the huge number of people in the country, it's a major impact. What's the possibility of a cure? I think a cure is possible, but I think it's not going to be curing everyone. I think they're going to be a subset of people where you can attain that goal of living without relapse in the absence of therapy. Again, it's aspirational. No guarantee it'll happen. Dr. Fauci, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. Good to be with you.